The community now known as Carpinteria has been around since before recorded history. It was first settled by the Chumash Native Americans who called it Mishapshnau. As this reenactment shows, the next name for Carpinteria came from the Chumash's carpentry skills. La Carpinteria, or the Carpenter Shop, was the name given to the community in the 1700s by Spanish explorers who were impressed with the Chumash's woodworking skills, making ocean-going plank canoes. But it wasn't until September of 1965 that Carpinteria actually became a city and was incorporated. In honor of Carpentria's 50th anniversary, here are 50 years of Carpentria news stories decade by decade. Official incorporation was September 28, 1965, after a fairly long and contentious uh, debate running up to the election. Those against incorporation didn't want another layer of government and more taxes. They're worried about property tax. They maintain that the size of the city um, was not sufficient to uh, really support the services that were being promised. And that ultimately, a city council would vote to, um, to levy a city tax on properties. The county kind of really stayed out of everybody's hair and everybody was worried that uh, a new city government would have more planning and, and zoning uh, restrictions, etc., which was also an argument in favor of incorporation. Uh, the pro-incorporation people really were uh, anxious for local control, and that's really what it was all about. We were like the stepchild of the county, and nothing ever got done here. We never had enough services, we never had enough police, we never had maintenance, and but yet we were they were collecting some of our taxes, so we felt that maybe we should keep some of our taxes. The night of the election, all the candidates gathered in the Robitaille's basement. Right here in this room, all the candidates that were running, we occupied this room. As a precinct would turn in their numbers, they would come over here and we would write down next to the name the amount of votes out of that precinct they had. Alan Coates, a former high school teacher, was the lead vote-getter and automatically got the position of mayor. The other four people who won a seat on the original council were Margaret Mills of Mills Drugstore, local auto body repairman Ali Olivas, local dentist Jim Gray, and local plumber Ernie Wolbrandt. One of the most vociferous um, anti-incorporation voices was Ernest Woolbrandt, um, who ironically was one of the top five vote getters, uh, was elected to the first city council, uh, ended up serving as mayor two or three times or and city councilman for over 20 years. He became one of the biggest advocates working for the city of Carpinteria and yet leading up to the vote and he himself voted against incorporation. So I'm John Woolbrandt and this is my mom, Mary Woolbrandt. Well, my dad ran for the city council, even though he was against incorporation, because he wanted to represent the people of the valley who also did not want the city to incorporate. He called himself the no-no guy on a go-go council. He was saying no to development, at least lots of development, and uh, the majority of the council was go-go, let's build, let's develop the valley. Not only was Ernie a councilman and mayor, he was also the unofficial local cameraman. And thanks to his diligence, we have his footage to enjoy today. Ernie just was the Johnny on the spot for any, any happening in the community. He, he was um, there to film it, to be there, to be... Um, I, I used to hear stories that he had... Uh, police scanner in his Jeep and he would listen and if there was something big and important happening he was right there. I think he was the ultimate um, civic booster. He was always videotaping long before you came on the scene. It was Ernie Wolbrand. He truly was Mr. Carpinteria. He really wanted it to remain a small town. I think the way Carpinteria is now is, has a lot to do 
with what he did way back then. Carpinteria's first city hall was located at this location, 4859 Carpinteria Avenue, currently occupied by DNA Design and Art. This photo is of the first city staff. Later, City Hall moved to 5096 Carpentria Avenue, once the home of Kentucky Fried Chicken and Chewy's and now Cielo Restaurant. When more space was needed with the addition of the police department, City Hall moved to the corner of Six and Maple next to Colson's Garage. In 1975, it moved to its current location when the city bought the property from Standard Oil. Finally, administration, public works, and police, as well as the city meetings, could all be in one location. The man who designed the original city seal was recently recognized by the Carpentry Valley Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for coming to the 57th Annual Carpentry Valley Chamber of Commerce Community Awards Banquet. The banquet honored Robert Perez, who 50 years ago designed the city seal, still in use today. When the city was incorporated, uh, they decided to have the, uh, the art classes of uh, Carpentry High School all submit their drawings to, um, to the board. And so from those drawings, they chose one of them, and I was lucky enough to be chosen. See, there's three rules. One was that it had to show the past, uh, the present, and the future. The Carpentria Museum was also born in 1965. Right at the time of city incorporation is when ground was broken on this property here at 956 Maple with Provisor C.W. Bradbury, for whom Bradbury Dam is named, uh, secured these county lots for the Historical Society. In 1967, Carpentria knew that it hit the big time when the first signal lights were installed at the intersection of Carpentria and Linden Avenue. While there had not been train service to Carpentria since the 1950s, the train depot was actually torn down in 1967. Nineteen sixty seven was the year that the Van Wingerdens came to the Carpentria Valley. In uh, two thousand seventeen we are going to celebrate our fiftieth anniversary coming to uh, California. They had researched the whole United States to find the best place to grow flowers. They chose Carpinteria because of the incredible microclimate. They have Carpinteria has fantastic soil and Carpinteria has a fantastic uh, climate. And since we are flower growers, um, and have been since the uh, mid-1700s, uh, we recognize a good climate and good soil, and Carpinteria has both. The big flood, the 100-year flood, was uh, January 23rd through the 26th in 1969. It had been raining since the 19th, where we were getting over an inch an hour, sometimes for six to 12 hours straight, um, so that by January 26th, all the creeks had um, jumped their banks. And we lived just next to St. Joseph's School, and that water rose so quick, and so, but it was in the middle of the night where we didn't even realize that the water had come into the house and completely flooded the whole house. And we wake up in the middle of the, in the night and we step down on the ground and splash. And we're in water. But just getting across Linden Avenue was uh, an adventure because the water was rushing down like a river. Up Lillingston Canyon, uh, the Pinkham, Milton uh, Pinkham home, was completely lifted up and washed downstream at least 150 yards or so with uh, Gail Pinkham and her three children inside the house. Uh, this was like about 6 a.m. in the morning, just a roar and a rush. All survived. We were all looking out the front window because Malibu Drive was underwater. And Mr. Ortega, and I think he had one of his dogs with him, <laughs> went yeah. up the street in a motorboat. <laughs> it was amazing. I volunteered 
because there was a lady trapped in that house that she was in a wheelchair but the problem wasn't so much the water was that there was also a bear trapped in there we went in with lights and uh, did our, and we never found a bear i was a student at the high school uh, it went right through our school, flooded the whole thing, filled the amphitheater to the top full of mud. The driftwood went maybe 100, 200 feet out into the ocean. Uh, there was everything you could think of on the beach. Uh, Governor Reagan came. He had a whole entourage around him and walked around and said, this is really bad, and he left. Even the National Guard was brought into Carpinteria and Lompoc both uh, to prevent looting. At least a thousand people uh, were left homeless. It was because of the 1969 flood that these these creeks later were were channelized and lined with concrete to uh, allow faster movement of floodwaters. People per allowed development to happen right very close to creek banks and boom all of a sudden there's flooding and that often happens in this kind of climate where you have very dry spells and then you have some wet spells. Yeah, channelization 99% uh, of the time is not a good deal for anything. Uh, but it's that one percent, it's that, that hundred year flood, it's that one time in a hundred years that you want it. The oil spill followed immediately on the heels of the worst rain that we had seen in decades. It was really uh, a one-two punch. It was an ecological uh, disaster that this area had never known. It is often credited with um, starting the environmental movement. I recall I was doing a job at the uh, right on the beach for a lady on the beach there and I uh, heard her screaming and yelling on the telephone. I was wondering if she was complaining about our work so I, came, I had no idea what was going on and I knocked at the door and said, is everything okay? Because I could hear you yelling. She says, no, didn't you see what's going on? And I says, no, is there something? He says, come on in. So I went into her house and went to the, looked out of the back and it was solid black. Union Oil Platform A, which lies just about six miles off the coast, um, was drilling a fifth well. The well blew out and it didn't just blow and I mean it blew a gusher of oil and gas but then it also ruptured the seabed and so every time they would plug the initial drilled well um, it started leaking in other areas. So it was really really terrible to watch the thousands of birds being that died because they were uh, emerged in oil. It came ashore in Carpinteria um, it, it made landfall or, or harbor fall in Santa Barbara. It just coated all the boats, all the tree trunks, and all the storm debris was on the beach. So now you've got oil slick on the beach, you can't just mop it up. It's all coated over all of this, uh, this tremendous debris field um, that stretched from Santa Barbara to Rincon. This was such a devastating um, disaster. The, the city actually went broke and had to levy a property tax to get operating funds to continue to rebuild. Carpinteria had hardly recovered from the rains, floods, and oil spill when the Romero Canyon fire occurred in 1971. It started behind Montecito and came towards Carpinteria. It really threatened the entire valley, um, the entire uh, foothill areas were being burned and the front country of the San Inez Mountains um, was all burned. It, it probably was the biggest fire uh, to occur in Carpinteria uh, in over 50 years. So the chaparral was ripe for, for burning. It came over the hill behind the high school and everybody would just thought the whole city was going to burn. Uh, my father was superintendent of schools. Doc Carty uh, was making the rounds uh, looking at the schools and, and I ended up on the roof of the gym with the garden hose putting the embers out. And uh, I'll never forget that evening. It sounded as though I was sitting by a large bonfire uh, and the crackling was right there. I can remember the Romero Canyon fire and the, what really sticks out in my mind we had we were at the football field under practice we had two of our players uh, I wasn't head coach I was uh, Mike Warren was the head coach at the time and they, and they kept looking over their shoulder uh, at the smoke coming out from 
towards uh, Toro Canyon and Romero Canyon, and uh, and and. So we're kind of losing focus for the practice, and finally the coach got a little upset, and he said, what's wrong with you guys? And they both looked up, and he said, coach, we have to go home. Said, what are you talking about you have to go home? We think our house is on fire. <laughs> Toro Canyon is notorious for capricious winds, especially with sundowners, and then when you get the firestorm winds on top of that, and a backfire came and enveloped four dozer operators and unfortunately killed four men. The the fire that happened has not happened since, and some people attribute that to the fact that, that there are a lot of avocados bordering the base of all these hills behind us now, and um, they're irrigated. They're not easily burned. Unfortunately, it is ripe for another fire in our mountains behind Carpinteria, so, I mean, of course, we have a lot more development that's occurred back there now. Um, more recently with the Rancho Monte Alegre and, and large homes going up in that area. Yeah, so we have to be extra careful. So I hope those folks that are using the Franklin Trail are being careful and understanding that it doesn't take much to get a spark going. In the 60s and 70s, one annual popular event was the Loyalty Day Parade. It occurred on May 1st and was in part a counterpoint to the Soviets' May Day Parade. The kids would dress up and they had baton twirlers and we had red, white and blue floats and all that stuff. And I remember Ernie Wolbrandt had his old army jeep and he'd always dress it all up with flags and different things. In the early 1970s, with the ongoing Vietnam War in the headlines, the Loyalty Day Parade was looked at in a new light. One year, uh, to make it more interesting and make it, it was kind of getting kind of boring with just the same old baton twirlers and you know per, uh, homemade per, uh, floats, that someone d decided to invite a Navy, some service unit to come and be in our parade. After all, it was a Loyalty Day parade, which was a counter to the Russian parade, which was really big. And people were, some people were thrilled to death to see the, a, a group of service people in the parade. Other people were totally against it, fuming, because it was warlike. Shortly after this, the Loyalty Day parade was discontinued. Carpinteria beaches have had their fair share of lawsuits, starting in the late 60s with the city of Carpinteria at odds with local homeowners. There was the lawsuit that was filed, and I think it was Roberts versus the city of Carpinteria, which was my father, and he was a named person, but it really was all of the beachfront owners. It wasn't just my dad. All of the owners along the beachfront had grant deeds, which described property that went all the way to the water's edge. The city maintained that there was a surveyed street out on the beach that was never built called Ocean Avenue. So the argument was simply, does the city have title to that Ocean Avenue because it was surveyed once as a street? Eventually, there was a settlement where the landowners got title to some of the land and the city created a public beach in front of it. However, another lawsuit arose a few years later. The Coastal Commission sued the beachfront homeowners between Ash Avenue and Sand Point, saying that they did not have the right to expand their seawall onto the public beach. This lawsuit was also settled. The Sandy Lamb Cove homeowners were allowed to keep their expanded rock wall in return for donating money towards restoring the salt marsh behind them and donating land for the future Salt Marsh Nature Park. The new high school was built at the end of the 1960s. Bill Carty was the Carpentria School's superintendent during this period. Well, Doc Carty was the superintendent. He just did a lot of things. He got Carpentria High School built up there on Foothill, and uh, he re they did some things at uh, Catalino School, Early Childhood Center. He told me he never expelled a student in his 26, year, 26 years plus at Carpentria School District. Uh, they always worked it out. Superintendent Carty hired Jim Compos to be the school's first bilingual director in 1972. He remembers the program's rough start. I remember a particular meeting. The anger and the intensity of the meeting, both pro and con on bilingual education, was uh, 
I mean, it, it was, it looked like the whole community could just, you know, uh, was combustible. Unknown to Jim Campos and Doc Carty, there were still strong feelings below the surface relating to Carpentria's segregated schools a few decades earlier. The new bilingual preschool program they started was based on the theory that for Spanish-speaking children to do well in school, they had to first have a strong foundation in their native language. This new program was very successful. The scores shot way up and we became very famous very quickly. Eventually, funds ran out and the bilingual program was discontinued. In, in the late 60s, one of the, the fun weekends for myself and my brothers and friends was uh, my father would uh, uh, take us down to the old fishing pier and we'd stop by Reggie's Bait and Tackle and get our, our uh, tackling food and candy bars. And Reggie had a rod and reel club that all the kids in Carp wanted to join it. He joined his club, you got a little card, and then he'd grab your hand and say, fish grabs a hold and takes off. That was his handshake. I spent a lot of time at the end of Linden, my family, myself, and, and uh, with my father, Doc Carty, uh, an avid volleyball player. Uh, later on in the afternoon, uh, we may go over to 7-Up Bottling Company and get a free uh, bottle of pop. Great memories. Coming up in Carpentria's second decade, the city landmarks are designated. The city's second decade started with a 10th anniversary celebration of the city's incorporation. Here's Guy Robitaille back then. And today, modeling a 10th anniversary hat and showing souvenirs from various city anniversaries. We won our first CIF championship in 1975 and that was a big deal in, in town. The Carpentria Warriors beat L.A. Lutheran in a score of 9-6, to six, played at the old Memorial Field, which was behind the current middle school. The big star uh, with that game was a kid by the name of Doug Pauley. He was a junior. Uh, we had lost our quarterback, Keith Bell, in, in the semifinal game, so Steve Perez uh, was the quarterback. I threw a touch and pass to my friend Paul. He caught it, made a great catch at the four-yard line, and. He dove in the end zone, put his head down, and knocked over the demons of the back, and got in the end zone. It was a great athletic play. He reached for it. The most valuable player of the team was Walter Riquejo, who uh, kicked the field goal in that game, which, which helped us win the game. They ran on the field after the game and tore down the goalposts and drug the goalposts down the street into the palms. And uh, In fact, I have a piece of the goalpost in my garage. Larry, there's a piece of the 1975 uh, goalpost from the CIF championship game, and I'm sure there's pieces like that throughout Carpentria. Carpentria City Landmark number one is the Ward Home Torrey Pine, the largest of its kind in the world. In 1888, Judge Thomas Ward brought a seedling from Santa Cruz Island and planted it here in his garden. Since then, it's been appreciated by many, including former Vice President Al Gore giving away his daughter in marriage. Landmark number two is the Heath Ranch Park and Adobe. Once the elegant home of Russell Heath, all that can be seen now is the oldest adobe structure in the area, as well as the original fountain and eucalyptus trees. Landmark number three on Linden Avenue is the site of the original California Branch Library. Landmark number four are the original palms on Linden Avenue in front of the Old Palms Hotel. Only one of the original trees is still standing. Larry, this is the Portola Sycamore. It's one of City our landmark number five is the Portola Sycamore. Oral tradition holds that this tree survives from the naming of La Carpinteria, or the Carpenter Shop. Spanish explorers under Gaspar de Portola came here on August 17, 1769. They were impressed with the woodworking skills of the Chumash, who were building plank canoes at this site. The Tomals, as the ocean-going canoes were known, were built out of redwood planks and the seams were caulked with tar from the natural tar seepages that still exist today in Tar Pits Park. The Coastal Act. Yes. That was one of the best things that's ever happened 
to this valley. The Coastal Act uh, it aims to protect uh, coastal resources, including agricultural resources. Carpinteria was a place that was growing outward for many decades. Uh, that area north of the freeway, those neighborhoods, single-family neighborhoods, are a reflection of that kind of growth where there were uh, development and annexations of agricultural land. We had Naomi Schwartz on mm -hmm. our local Coastal Commission, and I think she's the one more than anyone that helped set the, the line for where the coastal district would be here. Usually it goes along the first highway you come to, which probably would have been 101. She pushed it all the way to the top of the first ridge, meaning the entire Carpentria Valley is in the coastal zone. That that's, has not happened anywhere else in California. So for instance, agriculture is a very high priority in the coastal zone, and so agriculture was protected. Um, housing was a low priority. And so the, the city basically was not going to be able to push out into those areas anymore because to do so you would have required the Coastal Commission's approval. Shopping malls came to Carpentry in the 1970s. First Casitas Place shops, later Shepherd's Place apartments and shops across the street. Shepherd Place was very contentious in the sense that it was an avocado orchard and lemon orchard and it had been there and people were used to it and suddenly Mr. Tobes wanted to put in this development. We needed to have a place for our seniors. If he had proposed just any old apartment type facility, I don't know that it would have made it. Another large development that was completed in the 70s was the industrial park at the east end of town. It was needed. We had p companies that wanted to come here. I mean, that's in the old days when Sambo's was Sambo's. It's not now. The, the whole park was really built by Sam Battistone, who owned Sambo's. After it was Sambo's corporate headquarters, tenants have included the Salvation Army and Lynda.com. The Rincon Classic started in 1979 by Roger Nance and Jeff White. Then it went dormant for a few years and was resurrected in 2001 by Chris Keat. Here's some scenes from 2004 when the Rincon Classic enjoyed the biggest and best surf conditions. A few news stories from the end of this decade included a missing boa constrictor from the high school biology classroom. Various marijuana busts, including one rooftop marijuana garden found above the women's club. Marianne Colson, the carpentry administrative clerk and running enthusiast, ran the Olympic torch relay for the city of Carpinteria. And robotized candies became President Reagan's official inauguration candies. The robotized talked about their visit to the White House. We're waiting in line to eat lunch. Bush was behind us a couple people. But when we got in to sign in, all my men's were there. I mean, geez. You know, I'm getting all choked up about this. My kids are behind me and I go, oh, Dad, your men's. The official candy of his inauguration on the second term. Coming up in episode three, the Avocado Festival is born. Enjoy it, we are officially open. The idea for the California Avocado Festival began in 1986 at a meeting between community leaders Rob Godfrey, Connie Corbell, Debbie Murphy, Fran Cuccinelli, Bob Ely, and John Franklin. It's a festival to promote both avocados and the Carpentria community. One of the main purposes of the festival is to support our local nonprofits, service organizations, and schools and churches, and, and uh, I think we've succeeded. We are selling rotary calendars here today. Our unique calendars and I think the 11th year. We're fortunate to be here with Carpentria Beautiful in this lovely city. The Lions Club is a uh, local uh, community organization. Uh, the money that we raised last year, we gave 33000 back to the city of Carpinteria to different groups. We're at the uh, Carpinteria High School cheerleader guacamole booth. We're representing the uh, Carpenter High School Booster Club who supports all the boys and girls athletic teams at Carpinteria High School. Uh, this is the Carpenter Chamber of Commerce Bear booth. Three stages, 60, 70 bands every year. 
Um, it's it's family fun, safe, uh, good food. Uh, we're a zero waste festival. Uh, I'm co-chair this year with Mike Lazaro. He's involved with just about every special event in Carpinteria. There were lots of people that said we don't need a pool in a beach community. There were um, people who thought it would never ever be used. The school board at the time um, I think made a very good decision to allow the pool to be built there. What is fascinating in the end of the day when you go to the pool you'll find that it's always busy there. Many people feel that the city council election of 1990 was a Carpinteria turning point. The winners were Donna Jordan, Brad Stein, and Mike Ledbetter. What got us elected, I believe, is people wanted to preserve Carpinteria's nature, its small town uh, charm is a term that was used widely at that time. Up to 1990, there had been a continuing effort to develop the bluffs. Some felt this was necessary in order to have a higher tax base as the city was in poor financial straits. The previous council was for Measure M that would have created a redevelopment agency encouraging hotels to be built at the end of Linden and on the bluffs, but it was voted down. The 1990 slate wanted to save the bluffs as open space, and they felt there were other ways to improve the city's financial situation. I remember at that time, Alan Coates, uh, after we were reelected, that you needed to have all this development to keep balancing your budget. And I know that the three of us, when we were elected, we saw things a little differently. Donna Jordan recalls the last staff report before they took office. It basically said the city will be out of money by a year from June, which would have been June 91, and there was nothing left in the reserve fund, and you'll either have to raise taxes or cut services severely. And that's kind of what we were facing. And yet, after a couple of years of bringing in uh, a manager whose strength was uh, budgeting, we began to build up the reserves. I think they went as high as $5 million, and the city had enough money put away to weather this recent downturn and do very, very well. Pretty drastic reorganization of City Hall and the employee structure at City Hall was undertaken and uh, resulted in the reserves growing back to uh, millions of dollars, where I think they still are. And they hired Paul Marangella, who brought I tremendous did. change yeah. in terms of the inside of City Hall, all of us. Hi, Paul. How you doing there? Hi, Larry. How's it going? We kind of all struggled along at first because this was a new way of thinking. I mean, good grief, we were told that we were going to have a computer on every desk. I mean, who had ever heard of that, you know? I mean, it was, it was just so many big changes. Al Clark was the Slate's campaign manager and talks about their agenda. They wanted to provide more open government, more participation of citizens in government, more listening to citizens. They wanted to do the business of the city openly. And I remember the old council kind of fighting uh, against a certain councilman who I will not name. He said, you know, we're, we're going to give a forum to our local terrorists, meaning us, to go and speak. Now, of course, you, 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 we take it for granted that you will be able to go and speak openly and people will know what it's all about. It wasn't like that before. The three of us were the first to start televising city council meetings. Broadcasting the, the council meetings was a tremendous step forward to including the community in the legislative process. One person who came in one night with, with bedroom slippers on oh, came yeah. running in the back door because they'd been sitting at home watching and they wanted to come down and say something about that issue. Yeah, they, <laughs> and, they still do. That's when we started televising and taping the council meetings and you had to work in this little closet in the women's restroom and uh, so you've come a long way <laughs> since then. Another slate platform was moderate growth. It was the Herald at that time. They were very pro-development. 
you know, you must develop or die. We were accused often of being no growthers, which was never true. Now we feel like we're in control. And when somebody comes in from outside or even within with uh, something that doesn't fit, they're, they're told to skedaddle. It was kind of a big deal because we became the council majority. And at that time, the big issue facing the city was development on the Carpinteria Bluffs, where the nature preserve is now. 200 or more condominiums were planned for that space, and the former city council was in favor of that plan. The community didn't seem to favor that plan and elected us to put an end to those plans. After the slate won, but prior to their swearing in, the Lame Duck City Council met and approved a bluffs development which immediately went to the Coastal Commission. This led to an 11th hour race to the commissioners meeting. There were commissioners who were opposed to our withdrawing the application. So yes, they were poised to approve it at that time. Mike and, and Brad Donna were inducted into their, or um, put on the, on the city council. And immediately after that, Mike Ledbetter was sent I mean, immediately he left right from the city council chambers to travel to San Diego. I believe Arturo Teo drove him down there and he got up to testify at the Coastal Commission saying, yeah, we're the new government in, in Carpentry and we'd like to pull that plan back because there's a few more things we want to look at. So the Bluffs development was put on hold only to be revisited with some more nail-biting events a decade later. The 25th anniversary of incorporation was a big deal. There was a street dance, black tie party, and flea market. Event organizer Guy Robitaille managed to get a Navy destroyer to also participate. The large ship was anchored off the end of Linden Avenue. And they lit that thing up. You'd think it was Christmas every night. We had a fishing derby. And it was beautiful to see that they those guys that had their boat and they knew we were having a derby right in front of them and they blinking their lights. But there was a controversy with that Navy thing, to tell you the honest truth. Yeah. Why was that? It was warlike and we don't do war. The Robitaille remember some of the complaints that were made about the sailors. Your daughters are going to get raped. It was, oh yeah, the sailors were going to race all kinds of hell in town and it was going to be all kinds of, you know. It was just some people that just didn't like anything that had to do with war. And so we had to put up with that kind of thing. As it turns out, there weren't any problems with the sailors. In fact, they even participated in the dryland canoe races, also part of the anniversary celebrations. Wade Nomura was on the winning team that raced up Linden Avenue. They made a canoe that was land worthy. They put four coasters underneath it from uh, dumpsters. And we actually had to paddle those things. If you went around the island, it has a flagpole in it. Ted Rhodes' team had a special significance for him 10 years later with the Bluffs acquisition. It turned out to be the, some of the key players in the acquisition effort and, and I, was, I was steering the boat and I ended up like steering the campaign. Santa Barbara County experienced a severe drought in the late 80s and early 90s. Santa Barbara built a desalinization plant and some unique businesses sprang up. The popping up of small businesses that would come out and dye your dead lawn green. And opportunity knocks, I guess. But um, it was punctuated by a period where suddenly we got 60 or 70 inches of rainfall over the end of one winter and the uh, whole of the other. And it was um, the final exclamation point on that was uh, the March miracle. And at the end of the drought, the voters in Carpentria Valley, as well as Santa Barbara, Montecito, Goleta, and throughout the county um, approved uh, participation in the state water project. It resulted in the construction of a pipeline connecting Lake Kachuma with the California Aqueduct. I've been on the water board since uh, 1996, and the idea that um, the community is exporting $3 million a year just to pay for the construction costs of that um, but then when we need it, it's, it doesn't produce much in the way of water. It has been um, very sad. What is now known as the Linden Field at the end of Linden Avenue didn't always look so good. Well, the grass was all dead and it was just like a gopher, gopher city. Um, we went and took it over and cut a deal with the state park. Well, we're going to collect parking fees in your state park to offset, we will pay to put in irrigation systems 
and maintain it because your backyard is actually our front yard down to the beach. And so we did that and then we were able to use that park and provide it to the community at a better level of service. Bill Clinton and family stayed in the area just before he took office. He stayed at the Bloodworth Thomasons on Pedaro Lane. A minor controversy erupted as to whether the vacation home was in Carpinteria or Summerlin. Bill Clinton jogged on Pedaro in Santa Claus Lane and ate at the Nugget in Summerlin. And as long as we're on the subject of presidential visits to Carpinteria, many don't know that Richard Nixon visited here too and stayed at Sandyland Cove. I'm Martha Hickey and I'm fortunate enough to have probably the only picture that was taken of Richard Nixon when he was in Carpinteria back before the 72 elections. In order to offer trash recycling services and for other reasons, the city of Carpentria changed its refuse franchise from Channel Disposal to Harrison and Sons. Initially, it caused a minor uproar. Channel Disposal came and got your trash can out of your yard and wheeled it down and dumped it. And when we told the community that they were going to roll their trash cans to the curb, Oh my gosh. And not it only was, that, you had three. You, yeah, you, had you were going to have three containers. In 1994, Girls Inc. of Carpinteria began construction on their Foothill Road facility. The club's policy is to inspire girls and young women to be strong, smart, and bold. Up the road, the Boys and Girls Club built their facility a couple of decades earlier. They also have after-school programs and are known as the positive place for kids. Finally, another new facility was built at Lions Park in the mid-90s. The Lions Club of Carpinteria offer their lodge and recreational area for public meetings and other private gatherings. Uh, we're going to pick up the coastal view here. It's uh, Thursday, that's when the coastal view comes out. Love the Coastal View. Coastal View News was started in 1994 by Rosemary Finucchi, Gary Dobbins, and myself, Mike Van Stry. Uh, Gary and I still operate the paper uh, in downtown Carpinteria. We uh, also publish Carpinteria Magazine and Deep Surf Magazine out of this office. And our main uh, mission is to provide news and information to Carpinterians about Carpinteria every week. Many felt it was a welcome change from the days of the Carpinteria Herald which had gone through various owners and towards the end caused a lot of community friction. Those editorials were scathing sometimes against the city. What were their politics? I don't know. Well, to say they weren't fair and balanced. <laughs> the Carpentria decade ended on a sad note. A woman claiming that books are evil started a fire in the Carpentria Library. In January of 1994, the recently remodeled Carpinteria Library was burned by a woman. She had recently suffered a mental breakdown. Most of the contents were lost. In 1994, Larry Nimmer started producing Touring with the Candidates in order to show a more personal side of the candidates and their take on the issues. It's fun to watch because you see different sections of the town from different perspectives. Here are some scenes from the 1994 episode of Touring with the Candidates. Hi, my name is Judy Chesson. Should we go on our tour? This is our camper park here. This has been a bone of contention in the city side for a long time because it was just way overcrowded. Hi, I'm Jim Trotter. Would you like to come in and take a visit? Okay, thank you. There's some photos of some of my family. A lot of this is what protects us from growth. The fact that we have high value agriculture keeps this property from being just growing houses. They're able to find a crop that'll actually produce an income that'll match the value of the land. Hi, I'm Ken Daniele. You ready to take a tour, short tour of Carpinteria? Hi, I'm Gary Nielsen. You want to come on in? Okay. Hi, I'm Brad Stein, and welcome to my home. Come on in. Okay. <laughs> the, the previous council had uh, 
suggested uh, the way to revitalize the downtown was by forming a redevelopment agency and uh, myself and a few others didn't think that that was quite the way to go. Uh, they believe in, in uh, removing buildings and building new and, and I'm just the opposite. I think that we have a lot of historic value here and a lot of uh, uh, real diverse uh, architectural styles. Do you like to come in? Okay, thanks, Rob. Come on in. See where you live here. We're here at uh, number 201 on Eugenia Place. And it's been a, a point of some interesting decisions we've made over the years. So, especially these uh, tilt-up buildings uh, that you see down here. No matter what you chose, if you chose housing to go down here, there would be some complaints. Um, we didn't want retail commercial down here. But what we knew we wanted, and we needed room for, were some small businesses who might have been operating out of their homes. Hi, I'm Bob Needham, and I'm going to take an opportunity today to show you around town on a bicycle. The big building here on the right is Kilovac. Kilovac's a great neighbor. We'd like to keep him in town. Uh, but ultimately, uh, uh, we'd like to see this uh, into uh, visitor-serving commercial. I'm Donna Jordan. Why don't you come right in my house? I want seat. you to just contrast this with where we started off at the other end of town. Uh, we don't want to make the same mistakes at this end. This is uh, not only the entrance to Carpinteria here, but it's it's the entrance to all of Santa Barbara County. And I think this site, you know, cries out for it cries out for vision and creativity and just something beautiful that will benefit this whole community. And I think that as a community. In fact, as the last small town on the Southern California coast, we can't afford to settle for anything less than the very best. And I think this view says it all, and, and I think that's all I have to say about it. Coming up in Carpentria's fourth decade, the Citizens by the Bluffs. In 1996, then-city manager Samantha Orduño organized a community-wide visioning process over multiple days. Many diverse elements of the community participated and developed proposals that led to many important improvements in the community. I think the 2020 visioning process uh, was really the key to the growth and the development of Carpinteria into the well-planned community that it is. The Seaside Shuttle was yeah, one of the, the pro theme. projects that came oh, out of our shuttle. transportation study. And here's the first quarter. Uh, we've even had kids have their birthday parties uh, on the shuttle. And people go shopping on the shuttle. And uh, certainly they could take the shuttle to the train. And uh, so it's, we've, we've had over a million people ride that shuttle bus in the first couple of years. Ah, there we are and had a great ride on the seaside shuttle. The Carpentria Art Center also got support at the visioning meetings. The old Step 1 gallery lot was purchased in 2005 and the gallery merged into becoming the Carpentria Art Center. Being right across the street from the seal fountain, the property serves as a gathering place for many art events and exhibitions. There are also plans to build a new artist-serving structure in the future. Oh, God's got a plan for me! Carpentry Valley Art Center. I think it's great. Another program that came out of the visioning process was the volunteer host program, manned by seniors. They love to sit down there at the kiosk in the seal fountain and help people, uh, visitors, find places that they want to go and things that they want to do and places to shop. Carpentria has long been an agricultural community. Initially walnuts, then lemons and avocados, and more recently flowers. However, over time, the flower greenhouses caused controversy in the valley. I think what, what concerned people was over time the amount of them. The amount of um, greenhouse coverage of the land. The city council at the time um, didn't like greenhouses, they didn't want them here. They never appreciated the fact that Carpentry is small because the greenhouses surround the city and have um, kind of suppressed growth that would normally happen 
in the city. Uh, you can imagine if all the greenhouses were removed and you had condos everywhere, it would look a little bit like Los Angeles. Some of the issues raised about the greenhouses were their visual blight, nighttime light pollution, increased traffic, neighborhood overcrowding, environmental practices, and the amount of water they need. The uh, Gerbera daisy is grown hydroponically now. It's the best way to grow it. That water is recirculated, sometimes filtered and used three times before they then use whatever the excess is on the orchards that surround the greenhouse. So it's very water saving. Um, wa when you irrigate in a greenhouse, it's water saving in general instead of irrigating outside and having a lot of evaporation happen. One of the problems was that many of these greenhouses were going up with no permits. The Carpentry Valley Association took one of the developments to the Coastal Commission and uh, asked that it be stopped. And the city decided at that time that we would support that. The Coastal Commission wrote a very strong letter to the county letting them know that it was time for them to get control over this whole issue. The county decided to do a planning element for specific to greenhouses in the Carpentaria Valley and not to stop them but to say where they would be appropriate, where future ones would be appropriate and where they would not be appropriate. The criticism about the flower industry came at a particularly bad time for the local growers because of increased foreign competition. Now um, 80 percent of the flowers that are used in the United States come from South America. But what is interesting is Carpinteria grows about 80 percent, I think, is the number of what flowers are grown in America. So we are the last little flower basket of America right here. And when the recent economic downturn happened, many of the local flower growers were losing money. Luckily, you had a lot of conservative farmers here who had some resources they could turn to and, um, and keep their operations going while they improved the uh, efficiency so that they could get back to a profitable mode. Now you've got a much better balance. Uh, about a third of our valley is the city itself, a third is open f field farming, and a third is uh, greenhouse operations. One of the frequent claims during this period was the negative impact of greenhouse employees. Part of it was the impact of their workers. What impact would they have on, on uh, the city? There was concern about the impact on city services, the schools, parking and traffic. Neighborhood overcrowding became a big issue. We started getting lots of complaints from people about single family neighborhoods where a house would be overloaded with people and it started causing um, health, traffic, all kinds of issues, parking. Carpentria is made up of a lot of through streets, but it also has many cul-de-sacs. And if you have one house and you have, you know, 15 to 30 people in it, that's gonna affect the overall street. I, I remember one letter I got from someone saying, I live on a cul-de-sac and I can't even get into my home anymore and I wake up in the morning and there's there, you know there are people everywhere and there's there's diapers coming over the you know the bushes. Over time the city helped fix the problem with more code enforcement and inspections upon sale which looked for illegal garage conversions. The growers also became part of the solution. We try to provide as much housing as possible. We have several houses on different properties and, and our workers live in those houses. Recently, the city has partnered with People's Self-Help Housing. And here we are at Dahlia Court. This is a uh, low-income worker housing project that was really run down. Uh, the landlord had been taking advantage of the workers and the city was able to work with People's Self-Help. Uh, Jeanette here. One of our great partners uh, in recent years has been People Self Help Housing Corporation uh, in the County of Santa Barbara, who uh, together with the city have built a number of affordable units. Uh, the Dahlia Court project uh, was uh, converted to affordable housing a number of years ago. Uh, an addition was made to that in recent years. Now a new project, Casas de las Flores, has been built with another uh, 40 plus units on the uh, west end of Carpinterias. One final thought about the greenhouse owners. Most people agree that the flower growers have contributed generously to the community. 
our flower growers and the greenhouses have been some of our best citizens here in town. They've been very, very generous. The City Council undertook downtown improvements. The projects included street lights, landscaping, flags, and ball bouts. The whole revitalization of the downtown area was to build up so people would stay in town and spend their money here, and I think that worked very, very well. The more we, we analyzed and looked at Linden, uh, we realized that what was wonderful about it was how authentic it is and how uh, eclectic it is. We had some community workshops, with, and I'm sitting in one of those ideas. People said, wouldn't it be great to have a, a courtyard here? And, uh, you know, bless uh, uh, Ralph and Betty Brown and, and Mac and Debbie Brown. The, the Brown family ended up donating this, this land here uh, to create this plaza, which uh, has become kind of a center for the Avocado Festival and a lot of other events, and, and ties in really nicely with the Future Arts Center across the street. And we, and we looked to history and created this, this arbor with, with grapes because Carpinteria had uh, supposedly the world's largest grapevine. Carpinteria Beautiful has, has done a terrific job raising the money and creating this tile mural which depicts the grapevine and has the history of that. And they also then further down the street have a tribute to the Chumash Indians. It almost feels like it's, it's in an eddy. The rest of the world's going by and, and this is almost in a time warp to a, to a gentler time. In the year 1997, train service finally returned to Carpinteria. When uh, I was on the council, it was an, an effort was taken to re-establish the historic train station that was there and various plans were reviewed. But the main thrust was to get the train to stop here and to use the train as a alternative transportation rather than having everyone rely on the freeway and on their cars. Station stop in 15 minutes, Ruby Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, 15 minutes. In the late 90s, the city of Carpinteria allowed a group of parents to build a temporary skate park in the parking lot next to the train station. Motivated parents who felt like we should have a safe place for children to practice skateboarding and it was at a time when skateboarding was rising in popularity and the conflicts of skateboarding on sidewalks was a big motivator. Carpentry Skate Foundation, five years into the effort to bring a quality skate park to the city of Carpentry. Carpinteria Bluffs, it's about soul. At a time when the Los Angeles area had just sort of built out and so much open space was lost, it was a fascinating effort to preserve a 53-acre piece of coastal bluff in Southern California, which would be considered by most realtors to be the most prime uh, residential real estate anywhere. The Carpentria Bluffs had been a point of contention for many years. Development proposals had been made including hotels, condos, and an oil refinery. For many years, the Carpentria Valley Association, formed by Lois Seidenberg, worked to raise awareness about the value of keeping it as open space. In the late 1980s, Frank Serena and Ralph Brown had a development plan of hotels and condos that was supported by the Carpentria Chamber of Commerce. In 1990, the Lame Duck City Council, just days before they left office, approved the proposal. But when the new council took office, they withdrew the proposal to the Coastal Commission and revised the local coastal plan. Serena, Brown, and Chevron then sued the city for $50 million, claiming a taking of their property. A few years later, Gary Nielsen was elected to the city council, creating a pro-growth majority and a new plan by Serena and Brown was presented at a public workshop. On paper, their plan showed it to be less dense than earlier proposals. However, there was lots of public opposition to the plan. It's too dense, people. Including Dick Weinberg, who presented a scale model of the proposal, and in three dimensions, it appeared denser. One of the things that this shows is that a fire truck cannot get up and down this street and turn around. We also found out that the trash trucks couldn't get up and down those streets. Dorothy Campbell was in the workshop audience. And some woman got up and said, 
Well, after all, whatever we build will bring money to Carpinteria, and I think um, there's no better idea. I can turn red if I get really mad, and I tromped down and said, why don't we see if we can't buy the land and use it as open space? And Voss tells me that the... <laughs> I'm uh, Voss tells me that, that the whole place kind of blew up. And, and the nice thing was that I was up on a podium and as I came down from it, people were giving me $20 bills. Suddenly the tide had turned. People in the community thought that maybe they could buy the bluffs. And swing vote council member Nielsen changed his mind and was now in favor of keeping the bluffs as open space. By now, Shea Vickers owned the property and they came to town and tried to present their vision of a bluffs business park to the public. But they made a big public relations gaffe. When they unveiled their plan, they actually did it at the bluffs, but they had a small stage there and they invited a few people. But what they did also is they put Pinkerton guards around the bluffs so that people could not go in there and listen to what they were saying. Inadvertently, they had excluded all the people they wanted to win over, and they were criticized for being out of touch with the community. The Citizens for the Carpenter Bluffs, we decided we could not do this by ourselves. We needed another a partner, the, the Land Trust for Santa Barbara County, and David Anderson, who was with them, negotiated a deal with Shea Vickers for $3.95 million. However, the seller made the option good for only four months. No pun intended, maybe they were calling our bluff thinking we couldn't do this. Fundraising began in earnest. One method was to sell honorary deeds. We started selling deeds for a minimum of 100 square feet, hence a gift of $174. And there were countless checks that came in at exactly $174. The gentleman who donated a quarter of a million dollars toward the acquisition of the property overall got naming rights to the fields and named the fields after his mother, Viola. With nearly the whole town mobilized and with the hard work of the organizers, the funds were raised in the nick of time. Today, Shea Vickers, the former landowners of the property, are here to publicly hand over the deed to us for this special piece of coastal land. What do you think of that? Yeah. Shea Homes typically develops property and fulfills dreams of home ownership and commercial opportunities. It's a rare opportunity for us to sell an entire property for preservation without any development. Uh, I'd like to additionally comment with this transaction, the three lawsuits that have been going on for the last five or six years are also being dismissed and dropped. And, uh, and about a month ago we had a day called Bluffs Day. When I got up and spoke to the crowd, I said, if you can do this, I'm going to dance on the bluffs. <laughs> One of the keys to the successful outcome was having so many community members involved. And while the pros and cons of Bluff's development was divisive to many Carpenterians, in the end, most everybody embraced the solution of buying the Bluffs from the property owners. I think I'm in denial still that we've pulled off this minor miracle. In 13 to 14 weeks, the money was raised to buy the Bluffs. That was, I, boy, I, I wouldn't have predicted that ever. And it happened, and it was uh, quite a legacy moment in Carpenteria's history. It was like uh, the soul of the town remained and uh, will remain in perpetuity. It's about love for a sacred land. The Peace Corner at the intersection of Linden and Carpentria Avenue started in 2002, just after 9-11 and during the lead-up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. 
Santa Claus, atop Santa Claus Lane, had been a popular destination since the 1950s, with its miniature train ride, date shakes, and toy store. However, by the 2000s, the Santa Claus statue was falling apart and causing the roof below it to leak. The Santa Claus issue was, do we keep a 40-foot tall chicken wire plaster paper mache uh, Santa Claus um, along Highway 101? A new owner in the 90s wanted to get rid of Santa Claus, just completely change the name to attract a different clientele, let's say. Santa's days were numbered. We, we looked at all sorts of preservation um, alternatives. Uh, the owners were very happy to donate it to the Historical Society and suggested we stick it on our roof here at the museum. They really, <laughs> they really did. Eventually, a water district near Oxnard invited Santa to their lot, about 30 miles south on the 101. So Santa's still spreading goodwill and uh, has, has found a new home um, and survived to this day. This marsh park uh, was slated for de development uh, as far back as the, the early 60s. The marsh park was a heroic effort to reclaim what was once wetland, was once filled with dirt to make way for condominiums and that was clawed back and turned back into its wetland form. The, uh, UC, or the University of California's reserve manager, Wayne Farron, was the one who I believe deserves the most amount of credit for driving that project to its completion. But eventually, this area, which now has a me medium tide in it, will have a series at low tide of channel, mudflat, uh, pickleweed marsh, high marsh, uh, palustrine scrub wetland, upland scrub, um, and grassland areas. Ten years of collaborative building, ten years of funds seeking, ten years of planning, all resulted in the Marsh Park as we see it today. Winter storms of 2005 had a severe impact on the region. Mudslides and flooding closed both Highway 150 to Ojai and the 101 freeway near La Conchita. Uh, really shutting down the economy in the area. Uh, commuters uh, could not get from Ventura County into Santa Barbara County, although some uh, had workarounds up the 5 corridor and down the 101. Also, uh, people were coming into Santa Barbara Harbor by boat from Ventura, believe it or not. There had been a mudslide that destroyed homes in La Conchita in 1995, but the storm of 2005 caused even more horrible damage. Uh, a second slide hit in the same area and with unfortunate loss of life in this case. A number of, of, of people died, one whole family, just about an entire family was wiped out. Many people believe that the slide was partly to blame by the Bluff Tops ranch owners over irrigating their orchards. Carpentry's fourth decade ended on a sad note. Coming up in Carpentry's fifth decade, the Franklin Trail reopens. In 2006, Carpinteria's CIF football star Chris Gokong was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles and then also played for the Cleveland Browns. I think my, my most favorite memory was uh, Thursday night football at the Steelers uh, at goal line stand. That was wicked. Yeah, Gokong smacked him. His helmet almost came off. It was such a good hit. Chris Gokong is going to come right from here, folks. Watch it. Comes right underneath the fullback. No such thing as helmet to helmet against the running back. He's not a protected species in this league. Bang. Lead the way. And again, he's met in the hole and put down. And it's Gokong again. <laughs> Gokong's having himself a series. Two huge plays by Chris Gokong. You go play action and try to pull a fast one here. And he third down and goal. Men in hole. Didn't get there. What a goal on that stand by the Browns, and Gokong's in on it again. We're proud of a homegrown kid that, that developed his skills on our playing fields and worked out in our weight room and, and uh, uh, studied in our classrooms and, and 
was not only a good football player, but a good student. So we're, we're proud of Chris and for his achievements and kind of put our name on the map a little bit too. Uh, did you marry your high school sweetheart? I, I did, yeah. It's another cliche, but, but uh, yeah, I, I found a good one and I, I stuck with her. And I, I have a two-year-old. The warrior mascot imagery came under scrutiny in 2009 when a local Chumash Native American and others appealed to the Carpentria School Board to remove the warrior imagery that they found offensive. As far as the warrior uh, mascot controversy, I, I was in high school at the time and I, being a quarter Indian myself, I, I see both sides. Um, I can see how, to, how a Native American would think it's offensive, but, but from my point of view, I think that it's more paying respect and paying homage to the Native American. I think once a warrior, always a warrior. Uh, might be a little undersized and a little outnumbered, but we play like warriors. The school board decided to keep most of the imagery and the name warriors. Some Carpentrians still have strong feelings about the issue. Using a people's identity as a mascot is demeaning. To the grand opening and ribbon cutting of your A Street Bridge. Congratulations. The 8th Street footbridge was rebuilt in 2009. Termite ridden and crumbling. Many felt that it did not need to be rebuilt and that the old style was charming. However, others felt that it was just a matter of time until the bridge collapsed and that a new one was needed. The, the old footbridge in Conchaloma, I, I, I love that footbridge. I still remember in my mind riding my stingray and uh, hearing the clunk of the boards. One thing I do remember in the 69 floods, the whole center section was down there on the beach on that driftwood pile. I've grown to really enjoy and like the new footbridge though. In the late 2000s, Venico, a local oil company, wanted to extract oil locally using slant drilling. Well, that proposal of, of putting a, a drilling platform onshore at the Venico property used to be the Standard Oil or Chevron property right behind City Hall uh, would include a derrick of I think uh, 175 some feet uh, initially to drill these wells. Initially, Venico made a proposal to the city council. Well, they came in with a <clears throat> proposal. It was not receiving a great deal of favor from the council, and so Venico decided to uh, put it on the ballot as an initiative. The initiative was known as the Paradon Project, or Measure J. The Paradon Project had 11 Class I impacts, including explosion and re release of toxic chemicals and the aesthetics. Been tremendous uh, opposition to that, of course. Everything from visuals and aesthetics and sound and noise um, with the development of, of this uh, well, but also um, possible contamination or degradation of uh, aquifers. Um, what about a leak? Uh, we've got the seal uh, rookery that's directly offshore as well. It's right adjacent to the Vinico Pier. All of that oil and all that revenue would have helped the schools and helped the city and helped this whole area. The idea that you can pump hot water and industrial waste into the earth to obtain some marginal amount of oil just seems so short-sighted to me. We're better off to get that oil out of there. You know, we do have natural seepage. It's been there for years and years and years. And obviously, I think that's some of the what's coming up there at Summerlin now is the natural sea beach. Here are a couple of TV commercials that were broadcast reflecting both sides of the issue. Carpinteria is a beautiful, sleepy little beach town. And that's what Vinico Oil is counting on. The sleepy part, anyway. Vinico wants to build their noisy, polluting, 140-foot-tall oil rig right on the bluffs. On June 8th, don't let them fool you with false promises of money for schools or threats to drill offshore. If we don't wake up and vote no on Measure J, this will be the sound we hear 24 hours a day for the next 30 years. Measure J offers voters a choice. Yes on J moves oil and gas exploration onshore inside an existing oil and gas facility. 
No on J means more drilling in our coastal waters. The onshore drilling is a much safer way to access our natural resources. Onshore drilling is much safer than offshore drilling. If this field is ultimately developed from offshore from an existing platform, Carpinteria will get no benefit from that. Which one will you choose? Veneco, of course, was looking from the profit standpoint and they were convinced that it was a safe operation. But as we've all read in the papers, uh, safety is only <laughs> as good as uh, until it blows up. It didn't help Veneco's cause that the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred just before the election. The initiative was defeated. It went down <clears throat> hugely, 70, 30 percent. And some of that was, was simply because people were offended at the fact that they tried to go around the planning process within the city. Uh, the story of oil in this area certainly isn't over, um, probably until the last drop has been pumped. In 2010, the Carpentria Library celebrated 100 years of service. Library services now include computers and internet access, DVDs, lots of online resources including downloadable books, programs for kids, and community meetings. Next door, the Friends of the Library Bookshop provides essential funds for library services. The Friends operate the building courtesy the City of Carpinteria, who recently bought the site. The city created the Seaside Park for public use and rent the building to the Friends of the Library at a reduced rate in order to generate revenue to support the library next door. Also in 2010, the old Seaside Theatre Company took over management of the town's only movie theater, once known as the Alcazar, to become the nonprofit Plaza Playhouse Theatre. The remodeled venue has become once again a center for arts, entertainment, and civic events yeah, yeah, in yeah. Carpinteria. Really, this is the first step of many. We are now at the Tamal Interpretive Play Area. This is one of the projects that we've recently completed. The project was spearheaded by the Carpinteria Morning Rotary Club, who created a unique partnership with the California State Parks and the City of Carpinteria. It was creative because the state had purchased a strip of land along the railroad tracks that had not yet been folded in, at least from a planning perspective, into the Carpentry State Beach campground facility. So in a way, it was a little strip of land that did not have a plan. The idea and the theme is, is that we take the roots, the history of Carpinteria back, as far back as we can go from the indigenous plants to uh, the Chumash, the people that were here before us. So it's a children's playground but it's got a very strong interpretive element of the Shumash. And it is an expression of the story of the legend of the Rainbow Bridge, where um, Shumash were on Santa Cruz Island and they wanted to come back to Carpinteria. And so a rainbow was created for them to come back and anyone who fell off the rainbow were turned into dolphins. Woolbrandt Way in downtown Carpinteria was the appropriate location for artist John Woolbrandt, son of the street's namesake, former mayor Ernie Woolbrandt, to dedicate his new mural titled World's Safest Beach. The central portion of the mural is based on a postcard, uh, a photograph in the late 1970s. My name is Lou Panazon. I'm Susie Panazon. And we are uh, the Panazon family in the Carpinteria World's Safest Beach postcard which is depicted in the mural by John Wilbrandt. Years ago, Carpentria gave itself the moniker World's Safest Beach in order to promote tourism. Virgil Cooper took that photo for the Chamber of Commerce as a postcard and he did it for free uh, back then. So that's part of this whole continuation of donating your time, donating your energy, doing things for the community. Artist John Wilbrandt donated his services to make the mural part of a program of volunteerism sponsored by Carpentria Beautiful. In 2012, the Carpentria Valley Chamber of Commerce celebrated its 100th anniversary. The Chamber, um, we are an organization of businesses. We're united to create a strong local economy and a positive experience of life by representing business to government promoting the community, providing networking opportunities, and supporting a sustainable future for our business and the economic development. 
So welcome everyone and thank you for attending this glorious event, helping us celebrate the Chamber's 100th anniversary. Past generations had used Carpentry as Franklin Trail to hike up into the back country, but it had been closed for decades. Local ranchers who owned some of the trail didn't want the public interfering with their farm operations, and money was needed to reroute and rehabilitate the trail. Locals Bud Gerard and Jane Murray galvanized a decade-long effort. It included fundraising, working with the local property owners, and getting help from public agencies. Bud Gerard and I are the co-chairs of the Friends of the Franklin Trail, and in 2010, Bud invited me to, to work with him to help raise the funds to reopen the trail. Hi, guys. <laughs> Finally, the trail was opened in 2013. It's very unusual because there's not many places in California where the top of the watershed is so close to the ocean beach. So that makes it something that you can do in a few hours to go through all of that different types of environmental niches. The trail starts next to Carpentria High School. Currently, the trail goes five miles over the first ridge into the Los Padres National Forest. Eventually, it will go another three and a half miles to Jameson Lake. Tonight with a frightening bear attack in Carpinteria. The woman survived, but her story is terrifying. She described what happened to News Channel 3 senior reporter John Palmentary today. And John, this happened right near her home. Emily Miles was on her daily walk at an avocado grove right near her Carpinteria ranch. She when that bear saw me, the bear turned on me and started, you know, came up on its hind feet and was, you know, batting at me. I was fighting back, yelling at the top of my lungs, saying, get out, get away, you know, just really knowing this was a very bad situation. Miles said within moments she was wounded with scratches to her back when the bear stood up and took swings at her. She fought back, sustaining more scratches, then tried to escape. I took off running. And I ran about 100 yards, and, but during that time I looked back and I could see the bear was chasing me. And then the next thing I felt was this bear just taking a big bite into my thigh. Finally, that bear just came down on all fours and she just walked, started walking off. And uh, she looked back from time to time at me and I just looked at her. I took her by surprise when she was chasing that dog, which she was surprised by. Then she encountered me, and that was even a bigger surprise. On January 17, 2014, California Governor Jerry Brown issued a state water emergency. He asked all residents of the state to voluntarily cut water use by 20%. Our last serious drought was in the early 90s. Once again, we're faced with a severe drought, and so far there's been no March miracle. This drought is, so far has been the most severe uh, compared to the 89-90 drought. Uh, climate change is significantly impacting the reliability of our supplies. The temperatures have increased in the Sierra so much that the snowpack that we typically rely on from the Sierra is not materializing. Carpenterians are beginning to implement common sense water conservation practices like these. There are strong new ideas and technology on the table. Not only legalize gray water systems, make them mandatory. If you have lawns, reduce them by half. Learn to capture rainwater and put it back into the ground. The Highway 101 Improvement Project continues in 2015. Its primary purpose is to widen the freeway to three lanes in both directions. It will also include the construction of a wider Casitas Pass interchange and a new wider Linden Avenue interchange. Also, Via Real will be extended over Carpinteria Creek to Casitas Pass Road. The important project for Carpinteria is the Linden Casitas Interchanges Project, which not only will help address congestion on the freeway, but local congestion on our streets. It's anticipated that the construction will be done in about 10 more years. An aerial photo was taken on Linden Beach of our zip code 93013. 
on the date of 9.30.13 and at the time of 9.30 and 13 seconds. The project was the brainchild of the Coastal Views Leah Boyd and Peter Dugray. Finally, 50 years after incorporation, the community of Carpinteria came together to celebrate its golden jubilee. I'm Greg Carty. I'm so happy, proud, honored, and it is a privilege to be our mayor of the great city of Carpinteria on its 50th birthday. It's a wonderful time to reminisce, celebrate, and enjoy all that our community has to offer. We are so blessed. Happy 50th anniversary, Carpinteria. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Carpinteria. I love living here and I love this town. I'm Jim Drain. I want to wish the city a wonderful 50th anniversary year. Happy anniversary, Carpinteria. Happy anniversary. I knew you before you were a city and I love you still. This is Michael Ensign and we're wishing Carpinteria a happy 50th. Hi, I'm Joyce Donaldson from the Carpentria Valley Chamber of Commerce. Happy birthday, City of Carpentria! On behalf of the Carpenter Unified School District, happy 50th anniversary, Carpentria. Hi, I'm John Palminteri and I'm standing on Linden Avenue in the heart of the greatest little city in California. Happy 50th anniversary, Carpentria! Hi, this is Kiona. Happy 50th. Happy 50th, Carpentria. First District Supervisor, Salute Carb Hall. Congratulations, Carpinteria. You have a rich history and an extraordinary place to call home. My name is Aiden and I love Carpinteria. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary for the city of Carpinteria. Congratulations, Carpinteria. I'm Paul at Island Brewing and we hope to celebrate another 50 years in Carpinteria. Congratulations. It's great to be here to wish you a happy anniversary. You're a wonderful town. Uh, I have your 25th anniversary pin here and looking forward to getting the 50th. Hi, I'm Doss Williams. I'm the assembly member for Santa Barbara and Ventura counties and I just want to wish all of Carpinteria, including myself because I live here, a 50th anniversary. This is Fred Shaw, city councilman. I just want to wish everybody in Carpinteria a happy, happy 50th anniversary. Hi, I'm Roxanne Nimmer and I want to wish all of Carpinteria a happy 50th jubilee celebration. Happy 50th Carpinteria. Happy anniversary Carpinteria. Uh, Hi, I'm Timothy Grigsby from the Carpinteria Boys and Girls Club. Happy anniversary, Carpinteria. Hello, I'm Sheriff Bill Brown. Happy 50th anniversary, Carpinteria. You're one of the jewels of Santa Barbara County. This is Pat Kistler from the Chamber of Commerce. Have a great 50th anniversary. Hey, my name's Edie Kaufman, and I wanted to wish the city of Carpinteria and all of its residents and guests a happy, happy 50th anniversary. This is Betty Brown, and happy 50th anniversary. Hi, I'm Donna Trelor, and I want to say happy 50th birthday to the city. I was here the first year it incorporated, and it's hard to believe I'm that old, but me and the city, we're both that old. Hello, this is Curtis Lopez, and I want to say happy birthday, Carpinteria. Congratulations on 50 years. Hi, my name is Natalie, and happy anniversary. Hi, this is Lynn Graff, and I want to wish the city of Carpinteria a happy 50th and 50 more. Hi, I'm Jessica Wetzel. I love Carpinteria and I just want to say happy anniversary, you weird and wonderful place. Happy 50th anniversary. This is John Weldy. Happy anniversary to the city of Carpinteria. Hi, this is John Serta. I'd like to congratulate the city of Carpinteria. Hi, I'm David Powder. I just want to say happy 50th birthday, Carpinteria. You guys rock. Carpinteria rocks, I tell you what. Are you with me, Larry? Carpinteria rocks! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> yeah, happy birthday, Carpinteria. I'm Larry Nimmer. 